Awesome. All right. Well, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuhu, everyone. Um, whether you are joining us live here in the space or whether you are uh, watching our stream or inshallah, if you are joining us in the future at some point, uh, wishing you greetings of peace and blessings. Uh, today, inshallah, we're going to be beginning our uh, 2022 summer sirah series, uh, which we call Walking with the Prophet Sallallahu um, And this sirah series, we're actually going to be taking a different approach. We're going to be focusing on the shama'il or the descriptions, the inner descriptions, the uh, beautiful descriptions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're going to be prim primarily using uh, the most famous Shama'il uh, compilation, uh, which is by Imam Timadi. This is just one copy that is from uh, Imam Al-Ghazali Institute, but it, there's so many different, um, you know, different resources where the Shama'il is available. Um, I'm about to drop one of those in the chat as well, but it's it's available online. Uh, if you go to, uh, you know, sunnah.com or if you look up Shama'il, uh, you will see the Shama'il available to everyone. Um, so what I envision for uh, us, inshallah, before we jump into today's topic, which will be the uh, the kind of overview of what the Shama'il is, uh, and we'll be talking about the appearance of the Prophet Sallallahu we'll be talking about the humility of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Today's topic, uh, we're going to preface with respect to the Shama'il. What is the Shama'il? Why do we uh, call it the Shama'il? Why do people study it? What's the significance of it? Just so we have some groundwork with respect to that. But my aim is to cover all this uh, before the hour and to give some time for us, uh, if, if we would like, just to reflect back on it. Again, this is not a teaching space. This is not an instructional space. This is a reflective space. And this is a space where all the uh, content and resource that uh, I'm getting is drawing from the Shama'il uh, and specifically from this copy of the Shama'il. So again, you can look it up, uh, Shama'il al-Muhammadiyah uh, by Imam Tirmidhi, um, and you can see it online. Uh, but all of the all of which I'm talking about draws from this text or from any other Shama'il text. So uh, don't feel like there's anything outside of that which you may be seen as bringing in. So just to begin here. So what is the Shama'il or Shama'il al-Muhammadiyah? So this is known and regarded as the most famous collection of over 400 narrations compiled by Imam al-Tirmidhi. Uh, it details the moral, physical, and spiritual perfections of the Prophet Sallallahu and spiritual qualities. Uh, what it really is, is an invitation to experience the most detailed and most exquisite and intimate qualities of the Prophet Sallallahu So it's not just a biography. It's not just a descriptor. Uh, what Imam al-Tirmidhi did was compile all the different hadith and narrations that talk about how the Prophet ﷺ was not just with respect to his physical appearances, not just with respect to his mannerisms, but who he was um, in the house, who he was in the uh, with when interacting with people. Uh, what was what were the most intimate things like? What did uh, some of his most specific features look like? What were like his shoes like? What was his ring like that he wore? Um, what were all these different little intimate details to help create the portrait and this profile of the Prophet ﷺ. And many scholars believe that for centuries, the Shama'il was, after the Qur'an, the most popular and read book in the Muslim world. So just to kind of see that it was and still is a very popular text that was not intended to just be a compendium, not just intended to be a compilation, but to be a devotional text uh, with respect to people deriving uh, really uh, beautiful spiritual gems from, but also using it in a uh, in a very lived way. And so uh, the Shama'il at Tirmidhi is described often as a foundational tributary. That's a foundational river that eventually gives rise to an ocean of works on the topic of prophetic biography. So you see things that come up in later on in life. You see not just different biographies that come up with respect to the Prophet ﷺ, but you see different ways of remembering the Prophet ﷺ, artwork. You have all these different things, all the stuff that comes about. Uh, and a lot of the descriptions of that, a lot of the sources of that coming from the compilation of the Shama'il. And so seeing uh, the foundational importance here. Uh, and in the current state and days in which we live in, 
Uh, the Shammai is, is referred to a lot of times as a letter, uh, a letter to a community that has has been orphaned, orphaned of its spiritual father, the Prophet Sallallahu whom we have grown up without. Uh, we have, you know, come into this world and learn the faith and are, are kind of retracing our roots and drawing those connections back, uh, much in the way of trying to find uh, a long lost parent. And so we've been cut off from the Prophet Sallallahu in, in many different ways, especially from that the intimate ways when when the Prophet Sallallahu tells the Muslim Ummah and as applicable to people at that time as it is to us that none of you has to, true faith until you love me as much or even more than sorry more than you love your parents your uh, children and all of humanity gathered together so this is a very difficult thing to do um, it's easy to say it's harder to do but when the Prophet Sallallahu does this and says this uh, for us in our space how can we develop that love until we know that person and so the Shammai of us, uh, of the Shamail of the Prophet tells us that we need to help bridge that gap. And that's what the Shamail helps to do is, is bridge that gap for us in helping to recognize the Prophet on the outward and on the inward that we may develop that kind of love. And so, you know, in order to love the Prophet we have to know him first. And he's no ordinary person. He was no ordinary man to whom revelation came. And so uh, when we think about the significance and the meaning of Shamail, to, to go into uh, another segue here, the Shamail of uh, the Prophet and the word Shamail in the early Arabic lexicon was used and commonly taken to mean that that's oftentimes meaning character traits and, and description and whatnot uh, was used in some forms to actually describe water. Uh, it was particularly referred to a very special water source that was found in arid lands, in desert lands, which when people or caravans came upon, uh, would, would, you know, going for hours in the desert would stumble upon it, and it was pleasant for the drinkers who sought to quench their thirst. So thinking of a very specific analogy, a very specific use that, uh, you know, when we're living in this times now and, you know, at the at the uh, luxury of having fountain water and, and tap water and everything that's running around us, it's, it's hard for us to appreciate what true thirst is. It's hard for us to appreciate what that uh, what that yearning for water is, what that what that pure sip of water is like. And so uh, in that time, the description of Shema'il or the use of Shema'il was for that water source, which is achieved or which is found after a long kind of trek after just getting parched, you know, through the, uh, through the sun, through all the travels and really kind of feeling uh, that, that first drops of water after such a long journey and arduous um, kind of ordeal. Uh, and that, that feeling that that water was, that, that sustenance, that nourishment that that water was, that water was Shamail. And so similarly, we can take a look in our times now that we are going through uh, in our society, and especially in the United States, where regardless of where we might be and whether we're surrounded by a large Muslim community or not, there's oftentimes the feelings that we have where we've kind of are on an island. If, if some something doesn't uh, line up with us or if we are made to feel kind of isolated within community or if we're not even around any community, uh, it often feels like we're wandering through the desert looking for that spiritual nourishment. And the Shema'il in the Prophet Sallallahu biography and in the, in, the, in the descriptions of the Prophet Sallallahu can be that very nourishment that we are seeking for our own spirituality, for our own spiritual goodness and our spiritual benefit. So just as the body is affected by thirst, which it seeks to quench, you know, the spirit also suffers um, from the effects of the world around us and that the, the, the world around us will help dry us out. It will dry out um, the, the inner parts of us. And so we are coming to this Shema'il, not just as a source to study, not just as a, a text that we're reading, not just as a text that we memorize, but a text that's like an ocean for our thirst um, and an infinite source of nourishment and replenishment uh, in our everyday lives. And so uh, when we look at this, this nourishment, it's the source of it for us in this series is in the Shema'il and not just in the confines of the book, but in the essence of who the Prophet Sallallahu was, because at the end of the day, the Shamail is not about anybody else except the Prophet Sallallahu So regardless of the intimate details, a holistic aspect of it, the whole ocean, the body of water itself is called the Prophet Sallallahu And so uh, it's also a reminder for us. It's very practical when Imam al-Tirmidhi said it's a, uh, you know, wanted for this to be a devotional text, that this is a constant reminder for Muslims 
for how to conduct ourselves, how to live, how to uh, incorporate Islam within our life outside of the prayer rug, that we have a very lived experience and that this is a constant companion for us. This is that tool that helps us to walk with the Prophet <clears throat> which is something that we are intending for this series, that it is a bridge to the Prophet So uh, understanding the Shema'il is a basic critical part to any proper understanding or approaching Islam as it invites us to experience the most detailed qualities of the message bearer, the Prophet ﷺ, and it's mentioned as a religious necessity and a essential ingredient of sincere faith. Again, how can you love the Prophet ﷺ? How can you draw close to the Prophet ﷺ unless we don't really know who the Prophet ﷺ was as much as we know our parents or our children or our spouses or those we love the most? And knowing the Shama'il is a tried and true means of filling one's heart and filling that need for nourishment and that reverence um, with respect to coming to the Prophet, but it's also a way of doing our due diligence to the Prophet. When the Quran tells us to send salawat upon the Prophet, send praise upon the Prophet, this is one of those ways of rendering that service to the Prophet. Um, we send that praise because we read it and we are in awe of the Prophet, but also in awe of the faith that we have been given through this uh, person who has been lifted up as a example for all of humanity, as a mercy for all the worlds. And so this Shamail at its end, regardless of the knowledge that it may create, it at the end fosters a joy, a love, and a uh, warmness and mercy in the hearts for not just the Prophet Sallallahu but for the faith of Islam and for Allah as the creator of all. And so inshallah to kind of jump into this series here. So this series, which we've intentionally titled Walking with the Prophet Sallallahu uh, we will walk through, literally walk through select narrations and commentaries uh, from this book uh, that is uh, Shama'il al-Tirmidhi. But again, it's not just limited to this book. So you can look on Amazon or any kind of book retailer and you'll see so many different aspects of it. And there's of course, just the online versions that you can find and uh, they're all structured and broken down in the same chapter uh, sequence. This is just one way of putting it together, but we're drawing entirely from this book. Uh, and this is an opportunity for us to, um, you know, not just engage with the text, but also uh, we use this opportunity to reflect, to reflect back what were our thoughts on this, uh, these narrations. So I don't want this to just be a time for when uh, we just listen to one person and that's how we take in. This is a opportunity to engage with the text. And so we're not going to be going in specific order of the book. Uh, the book is ordered, as you can see um, in, the, in the chat, I've put in the, uh, the website for the, the sunnah.com. I'll drop it in there one more time uh, for anybody else that's joined here. But if you go to sunnah.com, forward slash Shemail, uh, you will see how each chapter is broken down on different characteristics of the Prophet Sallallahu What was his appearance? What was his lifestyle? What was all these different things? And so we're not going to be going in direct order like that from one to the end, uh, but we're going to be drawing from different aspects in order to help us appreciate not just the Prophet Sallallahu but that experience of what would it be like to walk with the Prophet Sallallahu So inshallah, before we begin, let me just close this blind here. There we go. Um, so inshallah to begin, we're going to be starting with the appearance of the Prophet So what I'll be doing for each series uh, next time going forward, we don't have to overview the Shama'il like we just did. We're going to jump into the direct topic. Uh, we're going to go through the different relevant section that will be covered for each uh, each session. And then we'll have some time to engage with how did we, how do, what, what resonates with us? What did we like? What, what do we have some kind of um, questions about? What kind of comes across as interesting? So again, this is not a, uh, a class. This is not one where I'm trying to just teach you about this. This is one where we are walking alongside together through this Shema'il, through this journey of understanding who the Prophet ﷺ was for the purpose of better understanding the Prophet ﷺ in our own respective context. Because even though we all may be Muslims or we all may be uh, in one certain category, we all see the faith and interact with our faith through very different lenses. And so the Prophet ﷺ and his Shema'il will meet us at where we are regardless of uh, who we are. So just to start with that, and again, we 
begin uh, in describing the Prophet and the appearance of the Prophet and all of the intimate attributes, the Shema'il of the Prophet by first and foremost sending praise to the Prophet sending praise upon the Prophet family, sending praise upon the companions and the uh, blessed successors of the Prophet and it's in their spirit and in the wisdom of their tradition that we begin this uh, this journey as we walk alongside. So again, you can kind of see the same hadith in the uh, in the Shamail section of sunnah.com or in your book, but just to begin here, bismillah. So the first hadith we begin with is actually uh, is actually is a is a kind of um, uh, is a report that was related by one of the companions, Abdullah ibn Rawaha. And he said that, just to preface us, that if all the noble signs of revelation were yet to come down, if there was no revelation at that time, that it would be the Prophet Sallallahu enlightened presence that would grant you the message, that this was a person who, regardless of if they had received the revelation or not, or anything as we have it now, it would be the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu who he was, just not just his physical, but just on the outside um, and his own eminence that would grant you the message. This was such of a person that uh, one of the other companions who at first used to be a Jewish rabbi, Abdullah bin Salam of Medina, said that when he looked upon the face of the Prophet Sallallahu that he recognized this is not the face of a liar, that the Prophet Sallallahu had this eminence with him that regardless of prophethood, he carried. And we see this in pre-Islam as well, when he was titled a Sadiq al-Amin, the one who is uh, honest, the one who is trustworthy, the one who people could rely on. Uh, and so you have this person who lived a very consistent life, who didn't just become good right after Islam, but lived a very uh, principled and proportioned life to where uh, people knew that this was a special individual, that he was a good person. Uh, and so when it when you imagine revelation comes here and the theological difference start to conflict, you can see there's a bit more, it's a bit more complicated than just outright rejecting this person because he's sounding crazy. But he was someone who people knew very intimately. He was someone people knew was very good. And so it was very hard to kind of balance the two that you have this really good and trustworthy person, yet we're receiving this message that's in conflict with what our parents and our ancestors used to worship. So it's a very difficult thing but just to understand that the appearance of the Prophet was part and parcel as part of his revelation as much as any other attribute. So to begin uh, with the appearance of the Prophet Sayyid al-Jariri said that I heard Abu Tufail say, I saw the Prophet and there is no one left on the face of the earth who has seen him apart from me. And I, Sayyid al-Jariri said, describe him for me. And uh, Abu Tufail said that he was white, he was fair complexion, he was handsome, and that he was of a medium size. And what I want the key word for us to think about here is medium size. This is going to come out a lot in the descriptions of the Prophet somewhere where you will see that he's talked about as someone who's in the middle. He's not someone who towers over some people. He's not someone who is just kind of looked over in any regards, but he's someone right in the middle. Uh, and, and this really is sig significant because sometimes when we think of a person of his stature uh, and with respect to a spiritual stature, you imagine that this would be someone who really stands out. But when, you know, when you see this later on in the top, in the biography of the prophet that when he claimed to be the prophet, when he was given the mantle of prophethood and he comes out and uh, says to, to follow him to, you know, worship Allah, the people said, why would you be the prophet? You know, you don't even have a father. Like, you know, why, why would you, your, your lineage is not uh, that connected to where you even have a father. Why not anybody else with the stronger lineage or whatnot? So thinking about who the prophet was, uh, and especially in this aspect of someone who's in the medium size, he was an ordinary person, but he was distinguished in that ordinary space. Uh, another hadith, Anas ibn Malik repeats or reports that Allah's messenger was neither very tall of stature nor very short. His skin was not extremely white nor very dark in complexion. His hair was neither crisply curled nor straight. It was wavy. Um, Allah sent forth with the prophetic message to him 40 years into his life. So he stayed in Mecca for 10 years and in Medina for 10 years. And Allah took his blessed soul unto himself at the end of 60 years with fewer than 20 white hairs on his head and his beard. So you see as well the description of this person who's right in the middle, but also someone who's very distinguished in their look that by the time the Prophet Hassan passed away at the age of 62, 63, that he hadn't really had many white hairs on him. He was a fairly uh, dark-headed 
uh, and dark haired individual, um, but just to see that he, he stuck out in different miscellaneous ways that uh, people knew was very significant, that uh, he was of a fair complexion, but he had kind of a reddish hue. So he wasn't just pasty white, he was kind of in the middle. And then when he used to walk, he used to walk with a bit of a confidence. But what's interesting is that he never used to boast himself in a sense of walking with a lot of pride, but he used to walk with a purpose that when you see this person walking, you know they're going to do something or get something done. Like they're, they're, they're on uh, a mission to get something done. And you know his hair used to be that which used to sometimes go to the lobes of his ears. Uh, sometimes it would go to his neck. And when he would go for Hajj or for uh, Umrah, he would shave his head, of course, but he would keep longer hair than you know, you'd normally see uh, a lot of men uh, keep, and especially in, in, in the Islamic world. And so uh, you see his companions referring to him that when they would see him, especially in front of the moon, they would say that we have not seen anything more beautiful than him. And this is, you know, a very hyper masculine society. So thinking how they describe the Prophet Sallallahu in such affectionate terms, but also just being captivated by this person who really just kind of falls kind of right in the middle with respect to all these different features, but is distinguished there, you see how much he really stands out. And and the impact that he had simply by his presence, simply by who he was in his in his physical appearance. Uh, there's another uh, hadith here, and what we're going to be doing, inshallah, is I'm just going to kind of be going through these hadith, and we'll just kind of unpack them little by little. But again, feel free to put your reflections in the chat or in the comments, and inshallah, we'll uh, kind of get to those and, and have some time for that. But uh, this is kind of how we're just going to go through this. And so we establish that portrait. Imagine we just walk outside the door, and the Prophet ﷺ is waiting for us as we're walking in this spiritual journey. And these are the things that we see. We see that this is a person who's not exceedingly tall, who's not exceedingly short, is a person who uh, has a certain complexion, who uh, has uh, you know, kind of wavy hair, uh, who is a person who uh, people see as, as a very beautiful person, but a person who's of a medium stature, of medium proportion, um, and someone who's very kind of uh, you know uh, distinct in, in how they look. Uh, when Ali, radiallahu an, the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu had described Allah's messenger, he said that Allah's messenger was neither assertively tall, nor was he very, very short. He was an average sized member of the population or of the community. His hair was neither crispy curled nor lank. It was loosely curled, it was wavy. He was neither plump nor chubby cheeked. And in his face, there was a rounded quality. So he had a rounder face, but he didn't have an overtly round face or an overtly uh, skinny or length face. He had a uh, he had a rounder face, but his uh, he was a he was of a fair white uh, with respect to a fair white complexion um, with a reddish tinge. He had large uh, dark black eyes with long uh, eyelashes. He had splendid kneecaps, his elbow joints and shoulder blades free from hair. Uh, that he had a strip of hair from the top of his chest to his navel. The palms of his hands and his soles and feet were very thick set. When he moved, he moved as if he were descending down uh, an incline. Uh, and when he uh, looked around, he looked around altogether. Between his shoulders was the seal of the prophethood, as he is the seal of the prophets. And he was the best of people in generosity, the most truthful of people in speech, and the gentlest of them in temperament, and the noblest of them in social dialogue and intercourse. If someone saw him unexpectedly, he was awestruck by him. And if someone came to know him, he loved him. His describer says that I've never seen the like of him, neither before him nor after. Now, kind of unpacking this as well, that the Prophet is seen as not a hairy person, that he's not, um, you know, someone who's overtly hairy per se, that he was he, he was someone who was fairly not not as hairy as you may think of, of uh, you know, other typical men in that aspect, but that his hair was kind of defined, that he had, um, he was very hairy with respect to his, his, uh, his scalp and with respect to his beard, and then he had a distinct kind of line of hair going from his chest to his navel, but uh, not, you know, overtly hairy on any of the other parts. And the seal of prophethood uh, will be something that we unpack as well. Uh, in, in the future sessions, but uh, it's it's kind of said to be some kind of a, of a growth or some kind of a uh, a thing on the back of his between his shoulder blades um, that was seen as a uh, as a mark of the seal of the prophethood uh, of it, it, it's it's just some kind of, of of a growth or some kind of a mark that is there that is understood to be the seal of the prophethood. But we'll, we'll kind of unpack that a little bit. But uh, that was one thing that's described in the in the in the report. But uh, apart from that, he's seen as someone who has broad 
broad shoulders. He has fully fleshed and sturdy hands and feet. When he walks forward, he walks as if he's going down an incline, but it's not that he's just like about to fall over, but he's going with purpose. So when you see someone going down an incline and, or they're walking fairly fast uh, at a brisk pace, then it looks like they're going to a specific place. And he had a, uh, a prominent forehead. Uh, he had arched and long, thin eyebrows, but they were separated. They weren't connected. So he didn't have a unibrow. He had a connected, um, uh, he, had, he had his eyebrows separate. But what's interesting is that his eyebrows were separated by a, one report relates a vein through which anger would cause that vein to pulsate. So it was noticeable when he would get angry, you would see that vein start to pulsate. So uh, it, would, it would be prominent in that aspect. But um, he had a full beard. He was a well-proportioned individual and it was reported that his stomach never exceeded the length of his chest. So he was someone who relatively stayed in shape, that he was, he was someone who was uh, right in the middle, but a good uh, proportioned individual. And it's really interesting to hear in this report as well, that when he would meet other people, when people would come and talk to him, that he, uh, when, 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 when they would, uh, you know, when someone would come around, he would, he would look around altogether. But when someone would come talk to him, he would do so with his whole person. So if someone is speaking to me right to my left, normally I'm just used to kind of maybe doing this, but the Prophet ﷺ would turn his whole body to this person, talk to them and give them his full attention. So thinking about what impact this has psychologically on uh, people when, when they are uh, not just feeling dismissed, especially if you're, you're someone of importance. Think about later in his prophethood when he is you know, the prophet of Allah, when he is the undisputed leader of the Muslim community, and he has that stature, yet he would still afford people, regardless of their, regardless of their background or whatnot, that full attention. Imagine what, uh, what that does to somebody psychologically when you come and petition someone who is like the Prophet for help, and usually people of that stature may just you know, refer to you to somebody else, or they may not give you the time of day, but the Prophet says, I'm turning to this person, giving them full attention was just a part and parcel of who he was. Uh, and, and people would be able to see him as a whole. So you don't see people just saying like, well, I kind of caught a glimpse of him from the side, or when I was talking to him, he like kind of mentioned something, but I only saw the side of his face. No, you see everybody that comes and talk to him, he approaches them and deals with them in a way that they leave awestruck because they see his full poor profile and his full portrait. And so it also tells us a little bit about just the power and the impact that each of us might have as well when we give people our full attention. Sometimes people may not, may assume things about us when they just see us from one side, or they may not get a full image of who we are because we may not see them head on, or we may not give them the full presence that they are sometimes due. So just thinking about what power full, full being fully present to somebody, especially in this society where we're largely on our mobile devices and just kind of you know, yeah, I'll deal with it. Or like, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this. What would that, what would that look like when we actually give someone full attention? And psychological studies and sociological studies will tell you the impact of just being fully present to somebody, and and how that has an impact not just on your emotional health and social interaction, but on their self-esteem, on on how they uh, are perceived themselves in terms of worth. So just thinking about these were things that were happening 1,400 years ago, but the Prophet some did so that was distinct then. It probably was not very distinct for someone to, you know, or probably was distinct for someone to turn their full attention to somebody and that it's marked in these things, but it's absolutely relevant for us as well. Uh, the Prophet some lifts up that or it's lifted up of the Prophet that um, he was as if like an honored dignitary um, whose face shone with the radiance of the moon of uh, on a full night, uh, like so the, the full moon on a night. And uh, this goes on that uh, one of the companions, Jabir uh, ibn Samura, said that I saw Allah's messenger on a cloudless night and he was wearing a red suit of clothes. And so I started to look at him as well as the moon. And for indeed, I realized that he is more beautiful than the moon. And so thinking about, uh, for those of us, it's kind of hard to maybe appreciate this. Sometimes we get a good glimpse when we're in the city, but you really get a different feel for this when you're out in the country, when you're in a desert or wilderness space where you see the full moon outside Side, um, where you really see all these different things kind of happening on the outside uh, and you see the full moon kind of showing and uh, when, when you get that appreciation of just all this darkness in the 
uh, night sky, but this full moon is there. And then thinking of what it meant to the Arabs, the Arabs who had, you know, not, not any kind of these like solar lights or any kind of LED lights that they have in the streets or whatnot, but just that that full moon would be what shines the rest of the land for them. And for the companions to see that, that when the Prophet's face would radiate, when he would uh, be seen that his face would be so luminous, it was not just as if, but it was uh, indeed, this is uh, a person whose face is even more beautiful than the moon. So again, this is something that he was just he was just blessed with was just something that radiated but thinking about uh, when uh, Ali had talked about that he was someone who would treat people with respect to the best of generosity. He would treat people with the respect of truth. He would treat people with uh, a noble kind of discourse. He would be a gentle person that this face of uh, illuminated face would be one that people would see and the, the comments that are made that this can't be the face of a liar, that this isn't the face of someone who intends us harm. This isn't the face of someone who is going to do bad to us, that in his own way of how he radiated himself, how he projected himself, how he showed his own temperament in his face, regardless of whether he was like the moon or not, was that they, you, you received this feeling of comfort and feeling of ease kind of being around him. And so Similarly, in this aspect, the uh, one of one companion or one person had asked uh, one of the companions, Al Bara ibn Al Azib, that was the face of Allah's messenger like a sword? Was it was it narrow like a sword? Or was it sharp like a sword? And Al Bara said that no, indeed, it was rather like the moon. So again, don't just look at this from a literal aspect. That literally, the Prophet space was not narrow and you know sharp like a sword, but it was more full like the moon. But also just thinking about the 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 message, this the 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 metaphor behind that. You know, what with respect, the, the Prophet was not sharp and harmful and and dangerous like a short sword, but the Prophet was uh, was holistic. The Prophet was like a beacon. The Prophet was beautiful and full and round like the moon. That that see these two things beyond just the literal comparison. That the Prophet was seen as as if the full moon, uh, and it, it was very much compared to like that, but not something that was dangerous, like you may think like Jafar and Aladdin or somebody very narrow or whatnot, that, that may have a very imposing kind of look, but someone who whose face brought tranquility to other people, whose presence brought tranquility, but not just that, whose uh, presence brought an illumination in the darkness. And the last one, the last hadith that we'll narrate with respect to appearance before we jump into humility, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu was narrating when he was, when he had gone on his mihraj and he was given this, this, this vision or this encounter uh, of seeing the prophets and he lifted up amongst his uh, his descriptions that I also saw Abraham, peace be upon him. And the nearest that I've seen in resemblance to Ibrahim or Abraham is your companion. And uh, he's meant himself, but he said that very much like the other prophets, uh, the one that met looked like him very much was like his spiritual father, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam. So just to give people a comparison of, of what uh, the, the messengers may have looked like with respect to other companions, but to the Prophet Sallallahu his look and his, his kind of whole complexion and uh, whole physical features on the outside looked very near to that of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So that's the appearance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Again, just to quickly recap, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was one uh, individual who was not too tall, not too short, was someone who's generally in the middle, but he was someone who was a well-proportioned individual. He was not someone who was uh, overtly hairy or someone who uh, was, uh, you know, just kind of overtly imposing with respect to their, their look and their gaze and someone who was very strong, but they were someone who was very much in the middle, but they were very distinguished. They had broad shoulders, that he had um, a distinguished look with respect to his hands, his uh, his arms and his joints and whatnot. His face was one that people would find comfort and pres uh, pleasant in, um, that his, his fate would, face would radiate. His hair was full um, up to his earlobes, maybe even lower. His beard was full. Um, he, his, his eyebrows were uh, long and thin, but they, they wouldn't give an, impl an imp uh, kind of like an imposition that, oh my gosh, this person's gonna be uh, harming me, that they, they gave a very natural and loving look to anybody, that, they, that on the face of the Prophet some you found warmth and comfort and how he walked would be with purpose, uh, but that he would not 
disregard anybody who would come up to him. He would be someone who, regardless of if he has to walk with purpose or regardless of his stature, he would give people their full due and attention. And that this translated into his temperament, as we shared in the hadith with Ali, that he was still gentle. He was still someone who was nice. He was still someone who people found comfort in. And so seeing the Prophet and we'll get to, inshallah, as we continue with the appearance coming up in different hadith coming along, we'll talk a little bit more about who he was even more and how he looked with respect to different aspects of him. But imagine that we've just walked outside this house. We're walking alongside this individual. We've described this person that you can kind of get a bit of a more of an image with respect to who this person was and who he, who he was to the people around him, that this was someone you would find comfort in. This wasn't someone you would find as uh, imposing in any kind of way. And so next we go to the humility of the Prophet ﷺ. And the reason we jump to the humility of the Prophet ﷺ and not just focusing uh, and ending on the appearance of the Prophet ﷺ is because of how we can see the Prophet ﷺ can not just apply to us in our everyday lives with respect to the outward, but the inward of who this person was and understanding who he was when people looked at him, but how that informed how he behaved to other people is very significant because if this was a distinguished person who people may think that, oh my gosh, this is a very beautiful, handsome person, a lot of times that can establish arrogance within a person, especially when they get praised. And you don't see that with the Prophet ﷺ. You don't see the Prophet ﷺ seeing that he's better than someone else because he may be looking physically better than somebody else or whatnot, that this was not the case at all. His appearance did not lead him to harm other people, did not lead him to think he's better than other people or put other people down. And oftentimes we see that in our society where people are judged based on their looks, their weight, their uh, physical, you know, outside appearances, um, but but not on what's on the inside. They're, the content of their character is not judged, but the color of their skin, their, uh, their looks and their abilities and whatnot are judged. And so just to jump into these hadiths, very similar as we did in the past. Um, so the first one is shared by Umar al-Khattab. So Umar al-Khattab uh, shared that the Prophet said, don't extol me. Don't extol me as the Christians have extolled the son of Mary, uh, Jesus, the son of Mary. I am merely a servant. I am merely a servant. So say that the Prophet or say that he, Muhammad, is Allah's servant, Abdullah, and his messenger, Rasulullah. So the Prophet just establishing here, once he had once he was at a station where people were accepting him as the Prophet, where he had a community, where he had strength and people devoted themselves to him, he warned his followers. He said, Don't go to that length of praising me or extolling me. I am merely a servant. And we see in our society that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And a lot of times people receive power and they become abusive of it. They become people who uh, you know use it to harm other people or they use it for self-aggrandizement that they bring it in to lift themselves up but he was telling the other people no don't don't do that with me I may be Allah's messenger but that's all I am I'm just a servant uh, and understanding that humility that goes behind that so seeing that this was a person who was dignified people would see him and he would stand out yet he would psychologically and literally remind them that, hey, I'm just a, an ordinary servant. I'm just like one of you. Um, as, as it states in the Quran, I'm just a, a messenger sent from among you. I'm not like some alien that's come from another planet. I'm just like one of you. I'm your countryman. Um, so I, I'm not someone distinct. So don't go to that extent of ascribing divinity to me. I'm, I'm just an ordinary person. And what's really interesting as well, uh, as this had actually, could have actually been mentioned earlier, but the Prophet Sassam would, when he was walking and when he was seen uh, in, in with respect to being outside, that he would lower his gaze. He would always have his gaze lowered and he would look more at the ground than he would at the sky. Again, thinking just about that, how this person goes about in the sense of seeing people. He's not walking around with his chest puffed out, looking at and being like, yeah, look at me, I'm walking around. But he's humbly walking around. He would lower his gaze, even in the company of men, even in the company of everybody around him, that he would just have this very humble look to him and that more often he's looking at the ground than at the sky. Uh, it just tells you uh, of this person who people would meet that when we would be walking with this person, we wouldn't see that he would be looking at everybody and making sure that they recognize him, but he's just minding his own business. He's just, you know, just going along in life and he's just trying to stay 
uh, within his own kind of confines. He's not trying to make an impression or trying to be the best in, in, in different ways of getting people to be impressed by him. He's just someone who is uh, doing his own due diligence and just, just being humble, but that his gaze would be lowered regardless of who he was speaking to. He would, he would go with that kind of literal modesty. And a lot of times when we see people with that lowered gaze, um, we, we sometimes ascribe that kind of shyness to them. We see that sometimes there's that modesty to them, but to see that as someone as a man in uh, seventh century Arabia, that as someone who had that natural shyness to him, that there was this humility. He wasn't seeking to boast to somebody, even though he had broad shoulders, he's well proportioned, he looks great. Um, he, he, did, he absolutely shied away from that, that he was someone who would still be looking at the ground more than he would uh, up above. And so, you know, when his companions would walk in front of him, he would say salam to them, and uh, he would he would he would he would have his companions walk in front of him. He wouldn't he wouldn't say like, "Hey, this is my group, this is my posse, you know, follow me." He would have his companions walk in front of him, and he would say salam to whoever he met. So anybody who would come to him, he would be the first to greet them with salam. He would make sure that they are extended with the greetings of peace. And what I want to share real quick in this in the time that we have is that when we say the salam in in Islam, it's not just a greeting. It's not hello, hi, how are you doing? The salam is an invocation. It's a prayer uh, that you say, may Allah have peace and blessings uh, be upon you. May Allah's guidance and peace and blessings be upon you. That is a prayer you're making for that person. It's a very intentional statement. And the Prophet would be eager to do it before anybody else would say it to him. Um, but additionally, how would he do it? He would be doing it just amongst everybody else. He wouldn't just be at the forefront and say like, hey, follow me. This is exactly how I'm doing. He would do this amongst the rest of the masses. Uh, Anas ibn Malik related that a woman came to the Prophet A woman came to the Prophet and said, I am in need of you. And so the Prophet said, sit in whichever part of the city or the road, a path that you wish, uh, that you wish, and I shall sit with you. What's narrated as well is that this woman was actually someone whose society had deemed crazy. She said she's someone who's lost. She's mentally not well. She was a woman with mental illness, that she had something, uh, some kind of uh, illness debilitating her. Yet uh, she was someone who, when the, she came up to the Prophet Sallallahu the companions had their own assumptions that, oh boy, like here goes that lady that, you know, is, is kind of crazy that you know she's not all together um, and she's just going to take up the prophet's time but the prophet Sassam honored her honored her uh, and uh, understood met her where she was she was someone who's suffering from mental illness yet he didn't ostracize her he didn't make her feel less than he didn't say oh you're not worthy of my company or hey you're a woman i don't want to talk to you he, he he said he he said she said i'm in need of you and he said hey pick out whichever street you want to sit in, pick out whichever corner you want to go to, I'll go there and I'll sit with you uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this. The honor that someone of that stature bestows to somebody who is uh, seen as on the margins of society tells us as well who this person was beyond their appearance. Again, we talked about this is a person that will turn their full body towards you so that he can give you your full undivided attention. Imagine the effect that that had on that woman. And for so many people uh, as Muslims later on who see this power differential come between them and their leaders and the attention the Prophet gave this woman who's seen on the margins, but then also giving her the time of day saying, hey, whichever way you go, wherever you wanna go, you tell me, I'll meet you there. We'll talk about this. Just thinking about who this person was, not just in physical, but also on the inward appearance as well. Anas uh, also related that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu used to visit the sick. He would attend funerals. He would ride a donkey. He would accept invitations from servants and slaves. And on the day of Banu Quraida, he was mounted on a, dark, on a donkey, uh, bridled with a rope of palm fiber and saddled with palm tree fibers, that he was a very humble person, that he was not someone who was coming in on a throne or any kind of a very kind of uh, lavish kind of entry, that he was a very ordinary person. And the Prophet used to be invited to meals of barley bread and rancid oil, and he would gladly accept the invitation. He would he would honor people who, who understood, understandably, there's not a lot of rich people at that time, there's not a lot of wealth at that time, uh, and people are very humble, very modest in, with respect to what they can offer, but but the Prophet didn't see himself above that. He saw himself as, uh, as, as someone whose obligation it was to, to accept these invitations, to not just do that, but in his role to go visit the sick, to attend the funerals, to, uh, to kind of accept the invitations of those who wouldn't be accepted by other people. Servants and slaves may invite tribes leaders and other nobles to their, uh, to their gatherings, but would they go? 
Probably not. And the Prophet ﷺ would make it a point to go. Anas also related that the Prophet ﷺ performed his pilgrimage on a very shabby camel saddle on which there was a velvet sheet that was less than worth less than four silver coins. And when he was performing the Hajj, he said he made this prayer that said, Oh Allah, make this Hajj a, a Hajj that is devoid of hypocritical ostentation, is one of showing, uh, and is not one of notoriety. So thinking uh, of the Prophet ﷺ, and we that we're, we're Hajj is now in the news uh, as, as much as it been previously. But you just see the prices that uh, that is charged for Hajj. But you also see how a lot of people who are very much uh, noble in their in their in their financial stature and their economic stature, how they go for Hajj, and it's very how Hajj experience and pilgrimage generally is has kind of become a very ostentatious affair in five star hotels and so many different things. We see the Prophet Sallam reminding himself, the leader, the person who shouldn't have to like go through all these different things, having to go through this and saying that may Allah make this a Hajj devoid of any kind of ostentation and of no notoriety, make it a very simple Hajj. Uh, Anas relates as well that there is no person dearer to uh, to him than the Prophet Sallallahu and he said that nevertheless, whenever uh, that he saw him, uh, that, that, that whenever he, the companions saw the Prophet Sallallahu they would refrain from standing up because the Prophet knew that, uh, or they knew how he abhorred uh, the people from uh, having to stand up for him. He didn't want his own companions to stand up for him. Normally when you go into a gathering uh, of dignitaries, of people who are respected or whatnot, you expect people to stand up and show their respect before they come and see the Prophet Some said, no, I'm, don't, don't do that for me. Stay seated where you are. Don't, don't stand up for me. Um, Aisha was also asked, his wife was asked that what was the Prophet doing in his home? What would he used to do outside of being in the mosque and when we see him out here? And she really said a very important thing. She said that first and foremost, he was a man amongst men, that Basharum min al Bashar, that he was a man among men. It was just someone ordinary, but she's also tackling this aspect of masculinity and what that means, that he was a man among men. And you think, okay, what is he, what's she about to say? That he was a warrior, he was sharpening his sword. What was he doing? That he used to examine his clothes for lice. He used to milk his goats and he used to prepare his own food. He used to serve himself. That's what he was at home. That his humility was that, that even though he's the prophet of God, even though he has all these things, he didn't just come home, sit on the couch and say, all right, Aisha, I would like to have this, this, this. No, he, his work did not end when he comes home. He knew that there were home obligations and he came home to do, give the due diligence to his family and his spouse. And it wasn't just he's consumed by his faith or his obligations there. He would come home and be a very ordinary person, but he would stand out um, as a man amongst men in that he would do the duties of the household. Um, and what, what we'll talk about, inshallah, next time is a very beautiful tradition that uh, is related by the uh, grandsons of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hassan and Hussein, uh, radiallahu anhu, that uh, they, they talked about the gatherings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, and we'll talk a little bit, actually, just, just to give a, a little bit of insight here before we open it up for any kind of reflections that anyone may have here. But uh, the gatherings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were those kinds of gatherings when people would come into the gatherings the Prophet would not be like, this is my seat. That's, that's my seat. This is where I'm supposed to sit. Everybody else gather around. He would find where in the gathering there's a gap. He would go sit there. He wouldn't make the gathering about him. That he would sit any seat that's available and he would tell other people do the same. Don't, don't, dis, don't disrupt anybody. Don't be a discomfort to anybody when there's a gathering. Just take a seat where, there, where, there's, uh, where there's a place. He would give each of the people sitting around him and each of the people in the companion their share of time and attention. Um, and he would make them feel as if they were the most special person in the gathering. And this is related by several companions that said that I was the most beloved to the prophet. I only talked to him a few times, but I was the most beloved because of how he talked to me. Um, and uh, he would listen to people who would ask a need of him. He wouldn't turn them away. He wouldn't just be like, oh, that's, this isn't the time or place. He would give them their full attention. Again, remembering how he would do so was giving them full presence, thinking how they would do so uh, and li uh, listening into what they need. Um, that he would give a cheerful and smiling countenance to anybody and that his good nature was something that was so contagious. It felt like this is this person's like a father to us. This person is like a, a, a relative to us, like a brother to us. Uh, and they all became equal in his presence and his gatherings were those gatherings, which I hope our gatherings can be and any gatherings that you have 
with your friends, your families can be in the substance that his gatherings were gatherings of knowledge in which people learn things. People were uh, transmitting knowledge, but they're also learning things. There are gatherings of patience, forbearance. There are gatherings of modesty. There are gatherings of trust and respect. Voices were not raised. People weren't shouting. There was no talk of ill talk of women uh, in terms of slandering or backbiting or inappropriate talk as we see in so many of our uh, groups and conversations in, in, this, in this time. Um, sanctities were not violated and people's shortcomings weren't broadcasted. They were all equal with one another, contending only with each other in piety and superior only on the basis of God consciousness or taqwa. And they would humbly revere those who are elder amongst them they would show compassion to the young and they were giving preference to the needy and they took care of the strangers. Imagine this kind of a gathering, but then think about that we're walking with the Prophet along this journey. We come out of our home, we see who this person is on the outside up until he takes us to this gathering of his, tells us to have a seat wherever we, we can find a space. And this is the person who from point A all the way to point B remains consistent, but how they conduct themselves is without an ounce of pride, without an ounce of uh, arrogance, but one that is consistent from the clothes that you see him wear to the inside features all the way to his mannerisms and how he interacts with others. So inshallah, we'll conclude with uh, this aspect of the Prophet Sallallahu of his humility. We'll pick up and uh, next time we'll be talking as well about uh, extended part of the humility of the Prophet Sallallahu but also more so the modesty and the character of the Prophet Sallallahu And inshallah, next time we will touch on these. But uh, as, as always, we, we remember the Prophet Sallallahu example is not just one that is to be kept in between the binds of the book that we put on our bookshelf. And that's the end of it. Um, the Prophet Sallallahu example is one that we want to not just walk alongside, but we want to walk with us internally as we go through life. And again, the book that we are using, that I'll be using personally, is called Ash-Shamail al-Muhammadiyah. This is uh, Imam Tirmidhi's Shamail. It's put out by Imam Ghazali. Institute, but you can find it uh, online, you can find it on Amazon, many different uh, resources uh, and, and similar um, kind of collections to it. But inshallah, next time we'll talk about the uh, the, uh, the modesty and the character of the Prophet. And so uh,